So, Bob, we have a bunch of emails from listeners directed towards you and me to answer. What do you say, Bob, that we read these and respond and record it and post it on the Internet? What do you say? I say that yesterday I was thinking about this in our opening, and I thought, maybe I'll say the thing Kirk says. Well, let's see if something interesting comes out of our faces. <laughs> this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Bob? I am a therapist in practice here in Seattle and your old friend from school 100 years ago. 100 years, at least. Y you look remarkably young. I don't. I think your hair length has changed, but nothing else about you is different. Maybe your beard's a little thicker, but nothing else about you is different from the day I met you. I don't know, man. 95? Uh, yeah. I'm going to start posting some Throwback Thursday pictures on Instagram oh, right of, on. of you and me. And I think I think both of us are, are definitely uh, oh. <laughs> we've we've aged. <laughs> I know I have. <laughs> um, so okay, first, e so all these email I compiled a bunch of emails about professionalism and ethics. Oh, anonymous patron, he writes, "Hello, Kirk and Bob. Your podcast inspired me to go to therapy. Hmm. I had a phone conversation with a potential therapist today. I told him about my problems, and I asked." How are we going to work together to address some of these issues? Mm -hmm. He replied by asking me why I would like to know that and that I am asking and, and that what I am asking shows a need for quote unquote control and that feeling me, oh, sorry, and that telling me his approach is not going to make a difference and that I need to trust him as opposed to interview him. He communicated this politely, by the way. I understood his point of view, but the conversation left a bad taste in my mouth. In general, I was under the impression that questioning therapists about their approach, even though it might sound direct, was part of the therapy process. What are your opinions on this, Bob? What do you think? Wow. Yeah. I'm a bit horrified. Yeah. I encourage people to ask questions. I was talking to somebody on the phone yesterday who was interested in hiring me. And he's like, well, what are you even supposed to ask? So I gave him like a list of five or six questions that I ask therapists when I'm hiring them. And I encouraged him. He's like, okay, so can you answer all your questions? And I did. I answered all my questions. What and are I those questions? It, um, how long you been doing it? What's your training background? Um, how much of your practice is devoted to folks who have my kind of trouble? Ah, how much, one. what percentage of the clients that you, so how long have you been doing that? What's your specific training with that? And um, there's one more, but I can't remember what it is. What would you do with me, maybe? Yeah, yeah, maybe what would you do? What is your approach, right? Like, so I, he asked me about that, and I was talking generally about, you know, attachment orientation and how there's a focus on our relationship and the experience of our relationship, which is useful for this, that reason, you know, and I'm being more articulate now, I'm just summarizing. Um, and I, I encourage everybody that calls me to ask these questions. I can't tell you how many times I've said to people, these are the kinds of questions that I would ask if I were you. And pay attention to not just the response that the person has, but how you feel as you listen. And I think the person writing in here is telling us that they feel uncomfortable, that they yeah. feel anxious. And that tells us something, you know, like, what's your gut telling you? I think your gut's telling you, you don't need us to tell you. You already know what you want to do. Um, I'd say trust that. Um, and I, I, um, I think that having no knowledge of a person and saying that you understand that their intention is controlling is, A, it can't be known, so sort of weird. And B, the thought that went through my head about this whole thing is maybe this therapist doesn't know how to do his elevator speech or doesn't know how to describe what he does or he, she does um, uh, well enough and they find themselves on the defense. Um, maybe they confabulate in their own brain that, you know, this is a good thing to do or maybe it's been modeled for them. I bet the second one. But I, I, I don't, I don't. I think if I'm going to a surgeon, I want to know exactly what is you, what is it that you do, and that doesn't make me a control freak. That makes me just a smart consumer. I don't like that word consumer. No, I mean you know in the broader sense, the yeah. consumer of a product of a service, and yeah. that's one way to look at it. Yeah, this is a huge, big time yikes. Uh, I agree <laughs> with everything you're saying, Bob. And uh, doing the analogy of a surgeon makes total sense. If if you went to a surgeon and you were asking them to help you with taking out cancer or something. Mm -hmm. And you said, what are you going to do to me? And they're just like, 
well, 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 you're a little controlling, aren't you? Uh, you know, <laughs> you just need to trust me. Mm -hmm. um, and you're just like, well, can you just give me a, a summary of what you're going to do? Well, I find it very interesting that you want to know that question, you know, that you're, that you're so controlling that, mm -hmm. you know, what, what did, what did this person, uh, why would I want to know that? Um, and by asking, it shows a need for control and telling me his approach is not going to make a difference. <laughs> you don't need to know, you know, if you know what I'm going to do, it doesn't make a difference and you need to trust me in a, okay. So uh, yeah, uh, it, this does not surprise me. It mm -hmm. is a very, it, it's one of the more common ethical violations that uh, therapists and psychotherapists will commit. There's a complete lack of training. I, I spend a, a, f a fair amount of time, but probably not enough time because of all the other things I have to attend to in, in mm -hmm. my training of supervisees on this question. I will say, um, I am a client and I'm, and I call you on the phone and I have trauma and I have just asked you, what are you going to do with me? And, you know, my trainees will just look at me with this blank stare. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And I, and I say, that's fine, because n literally no one has trained you on this. Mm -hmm. No one has trained you how to consolidate all the information in your head and communicate it to a layperson to properly inform them. Mm -hmm. And so practice makes perfect, and I'll model it. This is what mm -hmm. I would say. And and. It's also a, a culture in our industry th that certain ideas will flourish where uh, we need to keep clients in the dark about a lot of things. <laughs> and it, it kind of goes back to an old school psychoanalysis point of view, I think, mm -hmm. a power play, if you will. And it, it, the first thought I had was, I wonder if this person is a psychoanalytically trained therapist who, whenever you're asked a question you always ask a question back, you know, that the client asks, so what do you think about my story I just told you? Well, what do you think I think about it? You know, there's a there's a valid uh, uh, justification for that approach. I hate it, by the way. Mm -hmm. I My very first therapist was that this way, and I didn't know any better, but looking back, I, I didn't appreciate that. I mean, mm -hmm. after like seven or eight sessions of me talking and, and him just sitting there listening, which, you know, felt good on a certain level. But then at a certain point, I'm like, so aren't you supposed to like say anything about anything? <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you want me to say? You know, and, mm. and I just thought, so that's what this is? Like, I don't know. Yeah, and, and like you said, insecurity. A lot of people are insecure about yeah. their approach. They haven't been properly yeah. trained and they don't know any better. And so this is their defense. Right. So so not only this is this intuitively a problem, but this is a complete obvious ethical violation. There are two main ethical codes that are in all the professions, whether it's counseling, therapy, psychology. There are two main ethical codes. One is the right to self-determination or autonomy, the freedom to choose one's treatment. And so in order for a client to self-determine, they have to know what they're getting into. They have to be properly informed. And that leads us to the second very firm ethical code that's in all of the professions that is called informed consent to treatment. It demands that you, and this is the wording that's in all the literature, informed consent ethics demand demand that you as a counselor, as a, as a professional, as a clinician, not only respond in detail satisfactorily to a client when they ask this, but you have to tell them even if they don't ask. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what informed consent is. It, you cannot treat someone who doesn't have informed consent. And what is that? Well, consent is that they're saying, yes, I consent to this treatment. And two, they have to be adequately informed. And uh, in the ACA, which is what you're a part of, Bob, the wording is mm -hmm. adequate information about the counseling process and the counselor themselves. Mm -hmm. um, also, that the counselors inform clients about the goals, the techniques, the procedures, the limitations, the risks, and the benefits of the service. And that the key here are the techniques. You literally have to, have to, prior to... Uh, gaining prior to in, involving treatment, you have to say, here is what I'm going to do with you. And for uh, many therapists, one, they've never been taught this. And two, 
thus have no idea even how to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And three, get so insecure, you know, and they start rattling around these echo chamber <laughs> ideas. They're just like, well, <laughs> just, you know, it's it's interesting that you have a client. I had a really difficult client the other day who was, you know, being really borderline-y with me and asking me mm -hmm. about my, you know, it's just like, uh, no, actually, it's, it's, expl it's not a remote, strange idea. Informed consent. Now, having said all this, anonymous patron, might this therapist be helpful? I don't know. It could, this ethical violation could be uh, independent of their helpfulness to you, but mm -hmm. just know that that one thing is an ethical violation. You could actually report him to mm -hmm. the de Department of Licensing and say, I believe he committed an ethical violation by not uh, participating in the informed consent process, and here's what he said. You have you have absolutely a valid complaint. The likelihood that would happen is that he would be uh, just reprimanded, a slap on the wrist, and he would realize that he needs to stop doing that. Um, it, it's a process to go through the complaint process. It's not like just dropping off a note. Uh, you have to put your name on the dotted line. You might have to testify. So it's 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 not a simple thing. But but if you're up for it, it one is just and two you might help future clients mm -hmm. inc including his current clients mm -hmm. uh to get him to stop doing this because just imagine and and it'd be one thing if he responded and we're taking your word for it anonymous patron so you know, mm -hmm. but it'd be one thing if he responded like well um you know it's a great question and they he, he kind of meanders and just answers it really generally he started blaming you <laughs> and mm -hmm. saying this is a problem with you that you're controlling and you're just going to have to trust me. I mean, uh, like yeah. big time yikes that usually, and what, what I, I never knew in Forrest Gump, what stupid is a stupid does. I, I, when I saw the movie, I was like, I don't really understand what that means. Yeah. But uh, what I've chose to, what it mean uh, is that when people are, uh, problematic in one way, they're often problematic in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And if someone has a problem in, in this way, which is really two problems, one is this informed consent, uh, a, a lack of it, and then the two is blaming the patient, the mm -hmm. client for the problem, then you, often there are other problems that are present. So you might do a good deed for society by helping this person understand their problems so that they get the proper supervision and training that they need to get. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron in North Carolina, he says, I'm an employee of a student health center at a university. We have a wing of our building dedicated to therapists, and I've become friends with several therapists there. I also conveniently have a whole host of issues that require therapy. As several of my colleagues have private practices, I'm wondering if it would be okay if I approached one of them about seeing me as a client. I have had a difficult time finding a provider with whom I feel comfortable, and I suspect I would get along well with several of my quote-unquote co-workers. Does this idea tread too closely to a professional boundary I should not cross? Bob, what do you think? Well, I think what's important here isn't like thinking about professional boundaries is thinking about your own sense of safety and comfort. How are you going to feel if you're walking down the hall and you see your therapist? There's, you know, you may not feel good knowing that they know about you or knowing that they, you know, have intimate knowledge of you um, or having, it might be weird to have lunch next to them. Like, Hey, we're all going out to lunch. And then you're going out to lunch with your therapist. As a therapist, I wouldn't like doing that because, um, um, it feels dual. And if, if I lived in a rural place where I was the only therapist in town, like I, my old supervisor, David Tell used to talk about this because he lived on Bainbridge Island, which is, um, you know, it's not, I can't say it's rural, but it's a small town. It's yeah. a small town. It's very insular. It's insular because it's an island. And um, he said, I, I used to feel uncomfortable because I'd be out mowing my yard and, I'm, you know, it's hot. So I've got my shirt off and my clients are walking by. And there's really nothing he can do about it because he lives in a very small place. And so he has lots of dual relationships. The grocery store clerk is also his client or, you know, his kids 
Cub Scout leader is also his client, and there's just no getting out of it because it's a small town. But if you live in a big enough place where there's a choice, it's probably just easier and more comfortable for you and therapist if your role is just singular. If it's just like, we, I am a client, I am a therapist, that's all I am to you. And we can, if we can avoid the dual roles, it just feels better. So, can you do it? Yeah. Is it an ethical violation? No, but it's sort of grayish. It's sort of like, well, do we have a choice? Because if you have a choice, you're just better off exercising it. If it were me, what I would do is I would speak with these folks that you feel good about and ask them, who do you like? Who would you see? Um, great way to find a doctor, by the way. Ask a doctor who their doctor is. That's a good way to find a doctor. Um, good way to find a therapist is the same thing. They know people. So, and I know it's hard. I know everybody's full and um, there's lots of obstacles and I get it, you know, insurance and the whole thing. But um, I think you're probably just better off in the long run if you just keep searching. So yeah. I hope you do. Yeah, hundred percent. And the only thing I'll add is it's not likely that they'll take you as a yeah. client anyway, be yeah. because of the reasons Bob laid out. Yeah. Anonymous listener says, I have a question about my therapist. I am a new mother and I have been having relationship problems. No physical harm, but just problems. I've had two sessions with her, my therapist. In the second session, the therapist suggested that I leave my relationship. Is that normal? It seems quick to be making that assessment. I don't want to leave. I want to make it work. What do you think, Bob? I hate this. Yeah. I hate it. Therapists who think they know what people should do with their relationships are just wrong. They're yeah. just wrong. It's hubris yeah. to think that I know better than somebody else about what they should do with their relationship. That's especially, it's, it's nuts no matter how long you've been working together, but it's particularly nuts after two sessions. So I would talk about it with the therapist. Um, it would create for me a serious question about whether or not that person was going to do me any good because if they have this bias about me leaving my relationship and I choose to stay, what's that? What's the impact of that going to be on our relationship? How's it going to make me feel talking about my partner and the difficulties that I'm having? Am I going to feel safe? Like my, my therapist is receptive. Are they going to be in a position where they can comfortably help me? Now, therapist comfort is not key here, but but if they really have an opinion about this, you know, it's going to, it has this real, there's a real, eh, crap, I'm talking like a therapist. They're probably going to be biased. So are they going to give me good feedback? If it's guidance I want, are they going to offer me guidance that fits for me? I, I tell people regularly, and I'm a couple counselor, I tell people regularly, if you ever find somebody who tells you they think they should know what you should do with your relationship, run for the hills. They don't. Yeah. They don't know. Yeah. Big time yikes. Not surprising. Again, uh, I've seen this a lot. This is actually depicted in the TV show Big Little Lies. I think second second season with Nicole Kidman as a client and the therapist. Now, her husband was, maybe it was the first season, her husband was extremely abusive. Yeah. Uh, but... Nicole Kidman, the client, was not ready to leave. She didn't want to leave. Right. And even in that extreme situation, uh, any therapist that knows what they're doing knows, look, you, you can, as a therapist, say, I'm really worried about you. I'm really concerned about you. You deserve to be treated better. Yes. Uh, but to say you need to leave this person and there's something wrong with you if you don't essentially is the implication. That's the implication. Then, uh, yeah, that's extreme hubris. And even if you're right, let's just say you're right. You know, like there's some universal scale that, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> Athena is holding up and you just, you just weighed it out <laughs> and you just know that it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if a client is, isn't ready to do it, then what are you doing? You're, you're just causing a relationship rupture. Right. So again, it's not surprising. I, I know therapists that do this all the time. Yeah. It, it is. It, it's not explicit. You know, when they talk about not giving advice, this is what they're trying to catch. That there's there's a so there's two problems that I'll uh, uh, highlight. One is is the one that you're pointing out, Bob, and the other is is that the simplicity at which therapists are often trained. 
they'll, they'll, they're told, don't mm -hmm. give advice in the beginning of the program. Like there's just, there's a chapter on not giving advice and this is what they're actually trying to catch. But without the nuance, as time progresses, the trainees realize there's a lot of advice giving that you do as a therapist. You know, there's a lot of judgment calls you make about you've been traumatized and you need trauma therapy or, you know, just various different things like that. And the original ad advice about not giving advice gets diluted and before long, they just forget about it. And so the the problem is when you teach someone to not give advice, you need to hit, you need to give very specific examples like this one. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is that it's normal to have countertransference when you hear someone and they triangulate you as a therapist into their relationship. It's normal. It's one of the most universal reactions to say, well, break up with that person. Mm -hmm. Someone complains about their boss. Well, just quit. Someone complains about their neighborhood. Well, just move. Someone is worried about, uh, you know, their kid being in a particular school. Well, just change the kid's school. And it's almost never that easy, and it denies all the reasons why you want to stay in that situation. You know, if it was that easy, they would have done it. So it's not terribly dialectical either. Like, there's always two sides to a story, right? right? right. And a, a lot of individual counselors, you know, who aren't trained relationally fall into this thing where they take the client's word for it. It's like that's gospel. And then they don't take into account the larger issues and uh, guilty here because all my training is in individual, sorry, not all my training, a lot of my training is in couple counseling, but until my training was in couple counseling, I was vulnerable to these kinds of biases. And it's like bad breath. It's hard to smell your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, not to hack on your side of the fence, but... Uh, I mean, certainly marriage and family therapists are guilty of this too, but by virtue of the experience yeah. of hearing from f all family members and all members of a couple, you quickly are disabused of this notion <laughs> that one person's story is quote unquote accurate, especially in conflict. Right. So uh, it, it, again, it, now anonymous listener, might you say, hey, uh, I don't appreciate that advice. Mm -hmm. If you feel like this therapist is great, um, and you like this therapist, uh, then, you know, they made a mistake and yeah. you can say, Hey, I need an apology. I don't appreciate that. You deserve to be heard. And maybe you can actually move forward. There's nothing from your description that eliminates that possibility. No. Uh, so, you know, voice your concern and, and, but I would watch out for making sure that you're with the right person Yeah. and therapists out there. Just stop it. Stop doing that. Uh, anonymous listener. Uh, writes in, your videos have really opened my eyes to systems theory. Mm -hmm. I am a social work student getting my MSW soon. I have been in and out of therapy for my whole life due to trauma, relational problems, depression, and anxiety. I have recently been seeing a new therapist and she has really opened my eyes about how dysfunctional and non-caring my family is, particularly my mother. My mother constantly puts me down. I have a question. Is therapy supposed to hurt? With all these realizations, it has really been hurting me and causing me anger and sadness. Is this part of the healing process of therapy? Bob, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I know it's really, it's really hard. Now, listen, I'm presuming that um, you're in a very good therapy situation. This is a knowledgeable therapist who cares about you and is interested in your well-being and welfare. And that as you grow, you have these pains. Um, I, I think it is par for the course. I don't think it, it there's, it grow, growth hurts. It just does. So, um, so now, I'm not saying that every every time someone's in therapy and they have pain, that it must be a growing thing, right? Like, sometimes there's bad therapists who do bad therapy, and that causes its own suffering. So, I want to be clear that being in pain in therapy is not like, oh, okay, this must be good. It 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 depends. If I'm in a good therapy situation, then yeah, it, my therapy's painful all the time. I love my guy. I think he's a really good therapist. Um, but but it's... it's uh, excruciating for me it's mostly anxiety and shame that come up sometimes anger um sometimes fear of anger lots of things anyways um so yeah growing 
is likely to bring about things like anger, sadness, shame, guilt, fear, terror, um, longing. Yeah. And there's, that's probably just part of what it is to grow anyways. Yeah, absolutely. If you grew up being hurt your entire life and it becomes normalized to you and mm -hmm. mundane, but you're mm -hmm. still in pain and you go to therapy and your therapist says, wow, that's really, that sounds really hard. That sounds really painful. It's, how do you feel? And the person for the first time has the safe space to look inward and say, hmm, how do I feel? Well, yeah. actually I feel really hurt and really sad. Yeah. And the therapist says, yeah, your mom is, has been treating you really terribly from your description. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, gee, yeah, that makes, that's pretty depressing. That you deserve to feel your feelings. The feelings have been down there. You just haven't been acknowledging them and you deserve that. That's a normal part of healing process for sure. And talk to your therapist and say, hey, I, I'm feeling this and this and this is that okay? Are we going too fast? Or mm -hmm. uh, is this part of your plan? Uh, you deserve to have an answer to that question. I like how you say that. You say, um, these feelings are already there. You're just making room for them to come up. I, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. And true. Let's take a break. And when we get back, let's answer more emails. We're getting through them pretty quick, Bob. Oh, right on. Maybe we'll get to all of them. What do you say? Yes. All right, we're back from the break. This email is from Anonymous from Finland. And they say, in Finland, some hackers broke into a psychotherapy center's database. Now the hackers are publishing the patient's personal information on the deep web and extorting money from the center. What do you think about this, Bob? It's reprehensible. Yeah. It's reprehensible. People need a safe space. They need to be able to talk about stuff. Um, the other thing I think is I don't really write anything in my notes that anybody would find salacious or, you know, and I'm, well, I keep paper notes still. I mean, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but like, wow, what are these therapists writing in the notes that is so exploitable? Yeah. So agreed. And those two points, one terrible criminal awful and malicious. What's wrong with you <laughs> that you would want to do that. And two, it's a reminder for all therapists to be very careful about what you're writing notes because this is a particular situation, but more common situations are the file is pulled and it ends up in court and read out loud. And if you're okay with what you've written down and being read in that context, then go ahead. But there's a way to write notes that are legit that wouldn't likely hurt the client if it was read out loud in court. Mm -hmm. Anonymous listener from Switzerland. I have been seeking therapy. I didn't feel I was getting along with my current therapist. So I sent an email saying the reason why I didn't want to continue the therapy and I would like to change therapists. I clearly said that it was nothing against her personality. Then my therapist told me that this was devastating for her and she insisted on meeting with me, even though I had canceled the appointment. Mm. I don't know how to explain to my therapist that I want to change therapists. This made me feel bad. What should I do? Bob, what do you think? You're not required to do anything. Yeah. You, they can feel devastated and that they have their own counter-transferential responses that they get to work through in supervision or consultation with their colleagues. And that's cool. But... I, I've never understood the termination meeting that's requested by therapists. Yeah. I'm thinking somebody actually has to come to my office and pay me money for us to say, we're not going to work together anymore. Like, what's the point? Yeah. I've never done that. I don't, I don't even like the idea of doing it. I get that the therapist is, you know, upset. Yeah. Who wouldn't be right. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, that's for them to manage. So go if you want to, but it doesn't sound like you want to, and I wouldn't go either. So. Right. Yeah, this is a big time yikes. One, to be quote unquote devastated. <laughs> uh, one, and then two, communicate that. I mean, I, I get it. It, it hurts, to, particularly when you're early career, to have a client say, yeah, you're not really for me. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it hurts. You, you get into this profession because you, you want clients to like you. That's a big yeah. part of the reason. And 
you want to be helpful, you want to be seen as helpful, and to be mm. rejected in that way, you know, it's akin to a small ro romantic breakup in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have training and procedures that don't involve shaming or blaming or, you know, guilt tripping your clients. You reach out, as you say, to your, your con consultants or supervisors or therapists. And then, yeah, this, this insistence on a termination meeting is actually a cultural element that I don't agree with either, Bob. I'm glad that you don't as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing wrong with suggesting it. There's nothing wrong with a client wanting it. There's nothing wrong with saying, eh, what do you think about three more, th three more uh, sessions just to kind of wrap things up? Now, if a client is pretty insistent on terminating, you should probably offer those sessions at, at no charge because – you're forcing them, and if you're forcing them to pay money, then you, that's an ethical problem right there. Also, I've never seen a situation where you can't provide the discharge summary in a written form or a brief conversation on the phone for five minutes. There, if that's what you're concerned about, like, oh, well, if they're going to try, I, there's some things that they got to know clinically about their care. Uh, ethically, I need to communicate this to them. Yeah, okay. But you don't need to make them pay for a meeting with you. Mm -mm. Um, so yeah, uh, what should you do? Uh, as Bob says, do nothing. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't want to attend it, don't. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's completely up to you. It's, yeah. th this is her problem. Uh, yes. she, she needs to work out for herself. Uh, Taylor, she writes in and says, after finding your channel and podcasts, I've been looking into going to therapy. The only thing that's available in my area are "quote unquote" counselors. I was wondering what your dif what the difference between therapists and counselors are. I don't know if one is better than the other when it comes to dealing with trauma. Bob, what do you think? Oh, interesting. I'm kind of curious to hear what you think about this, but I use those words interchangeably. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Washington. So I'm a counselor and I often use that word. I've never really loved that word, but I've used that word all the time. Why do you like that word? I don't know. I just, I think I like the word therapist better. It sounds more prestigious and it sounds more healing. I don't know. Healing. Healing. Yeah. yeah. C counselor to me sounds more, you know, the word counselor will use for a school counselor that helps you with your admissions into university yeah. or, Right. A counselor will be someone who works at a camp, like a teenager who is a, yeah. a camp counselor. Right. Or an attorney will sometimes be called be a counselor. counselor. Yeah. A therapist is, you know, to provide therapy is almost always associated with some kind of healing process. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that you would like that word, yeah. Yeah. Um, you and I come from a time, correct me if I'm wrong on mm -hmm. this, that it was very interchangeable. I, I, I remember uh, not having anyone say that there was a difference. Um, but as the professions have become more uh, bifurcated and siloed, there's this natural differentiation, delineation, determination <laughs> of, look, I'm a licensed marriage and family. So I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and you're mm -hmm. a licensed mental health counselor. And so mm -hmm. in the time that you and I have been in this profession, I think now my sense is, is that most people will insist that if you're saying therapist, you must be referring to a marriage and family therapist. And if you're a counselor, you have to be referring to a mental health counselor. What do they say about the social workers? Uh, they're, they have to be called social workers. They can't really? be called counselors and they, call, they can't be called therapists. Interesting. I mean, it kind of makes sense because it's in the word, you know, right. I, I'm, I'm a licensed therapist. You're a licensed counselor. That's true. Um, and then everyone in that field of, of mental health counseling, you have licensed professional counselor, licensed clinical professional counselor. These are all MHC professional counselor, counselor counselors. You know, there, there's no counselor license that is called a therapist in any state of the United States. And I think that's on purpose. And the same way that, you know, psychologists, right? Um, so it's, um, I think that's a trend. I, I don't particularly care for that. I, I don't, uh, in, in one, uh, one thing I'll say is it actually annoys me that we even have these differences. And my take and what I've heard from historians in our field is that you originally had psychiatry mm -hmm. and they were an elitist group of people. 
and psychologists came along and said, you know, we're not medical people. We didn't go to medical school. We studied psychology and we would like to be included in the club of psychiatric services. And psychiatrists were like, no, you are substandard and we hold the keys because we have the political power and the cultural power. And so screw you guys. And then psychologists spent a lot of time professionalizing their profession mm -hmm. and built up a whole thing and lobbied for their own license and their own professional organizations. And then counselors came along and said, we would like to be included as a subset of psychology. You know, we are counselors, we're master's level counselors. We, we can provide this, this counseling service. Please psychologists, will you let us in? Because we're, we're also non-medical, but, but we're, we don't have a doctorate, we have a master's, please let us in. And psychologists said, screw you guys. You guys are substandard. Mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're gonna actively lobby against you to ever have any licensure or reimbursement from insurance. Yeah. And counselors fought back and got their own. And then licensed marriage and family therapists came along and said, hey, everyone, let us in the club. And they said, no, you are substandard. You're, you're what is family therapy? It's a joke. And we fought and lobbied and got, you know, every step along the way, a new profession complete with its own ethical codes, its own training programs, its own licensing procedures, its own reimbursement categories. And it's so effing stupid. The medical field doesn't do this. When a podiatrist wants to enter the medical field, they don't create a completely different profession. They're, they get trained as medical doctors in medical school, the same medical school that psychiatrists are trained in. And Somehow when it comes to psychology and psychotherapy, everyone is, it, it, and if you're an outsider, you, you probably don't know this, but it is literally completely different professions as if they're not even related. Yeah. As if, uh, you know, the, the legal definition between me and Bob is the same difference between me and like a plumber in terms of how the law <laughs> deals with us. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, I don't share any professional codes or any legal designations with a plumber. You know, I'm guessing there's like some kind of designation as a as an uh, authorized plumber or something in a state. I don't know. Yeah. But it's a completely different profession, and it's it's ridiculous, and it's all based on jealousy mm -hmm. and worry of resource mm -hmm. uh, uh, being taken away and of elitism mm -hmm. each step of the way. And the, the next the next phase of this is coaches. And oh, so right. are we going to do this again? Are we, yes. are we going to push coaches out? Because yes, as right is happening, they're creating yeah. their own profession. Yeah. They're creating their own licensing, mm -hmm. their own education, mm -hmm. and they're becoming professionalized. Do we want to let them in? I, uh, I, I, there's a debate about it, but mm -hmm. uh, are we going to do this all over again? Or could we create a subsection of therapy or counseling or psychology where everyone understands they're not psychologists, they're not as educated, they're not able to provide clinical services, but they are able to do some things. Mm -hmm. The way like a phlebotomist is in the medical field. Mm -hmm. They're not able to do heart surgery, but they are able to do what they do in yeah. the medical field. They're trained, right. you know, every, it, it, everyone understands that. We don't have to kick people, we don't have to not yeah. let people in, you know yeah. what I mean? So anyway, um, the various different names for this are several. You have therapists, which are typically licensed marriage and family therapists. You also have the word therapist being used for physical therapist. Mm -hmm. So in, when I'm in a particular context and I say I'm a therapist, they'll, they'll, they think I'm a physical therapist. Right. <laughs> then you have counselors. So that's mental health counselor, licensed professional counselor, licensed clinical professional counselor. And you have non-clinical counselors that are like when I was – a pre-master's level youth worker, I was called a counselor, mm -hmm. which is another reason why I'm guessing you don't like being called a counselor because it's just such a, such a, uh, I don't know, a broadly used term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the other term is psychologist, mm -hmm. which is a, a doctoral level. You can have a doctorate level therapist. You can have a doctorate level counselor, but they can also be master's level. Psychologists are always doctorate level and they're licensed psychologists in their state. Mm -hmm. And they, they went to a particular, so to get a, to get a license, to be a therapist, to be, if I'm just going to delineate between therapists and counselors, you have to get a marriage and family therapy degree. To be a counselor, you have to get a mental health counseling degree. To be a psychologist, you have to get a psychology degree. 
I have a psychology doctorate and I have mm -hmm. a master's in marriage and family therapy. So I could call myself a therapist. I could possibly call myself a psychologist if I bothered to take the test, but I don't care to because it, there's just, there's no benefit to me to being a licensed psychologist. So mm -mm. I am, I'm like, you know, 0.1% towards the finish line of being called myself a psychologist, but I don't, I, I don't care to. Plus, yeah. I don't want to get into it, but there's just, it's fine being, a, I, and I love marriage and family therapy. It's, yeah. that's, that's my primary, that's what I teach. And I, anyway. Um, then you have social workers who are licensed social workers. Now, social worker can also refer to people that just work for DSHS. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they call them line workers or case workers, but sometimes they're called social workers. And so sometimes the word social work is applied to someone like you and me, Bob, who can provide, who was licensed, who can provide services. But sometimes the word social worker is just provided to someone who works for the state who is a worker that works in social services and, and it's not clinical. It's right. like case management. Yeah. There's psychiatrists. These are medical people. That's pretty it's cut and dry. And psychiatric nurses, same. Uh, and then you have the word psychotherapist. And so all the people I've mentioned so far could provide psychotherapy or not. So this is basically just someone who provides talk therapy, a psychotherapist. Uh, then you have the word clinician, which obviously can refer to a broad variety of cl clinical services. You have school counselors. Sometimes that refers to an actual person like me and Bob. Sometimes school counselors are people that uh, are more akin to a teacher mm -hmm. and will help people with their college admissions or finding a therapist or this kind of thing. You have behavioral health clinicians. You have life coaches. Anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of different names and it drives me nuts. What's interesting to me about this is I've been on teams with social workers, with psychologists, with other licensed counselors. We all do the same stuff. We yeah. all, I mean, everybody, it's like we all got to the top of the mountain and the path that we each took is a little bit different. And there are differences. Um, I have a bit of envy for um, psychologists because they often have had really rigorous training. Like I, I remember you going through that and well, I didn't envy the hell you went through because it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I did envy the uh, knowledge base that um, you developed as a result of your willingness and your good effort. But to be honest, it's never, I've thought about it, but it's never been worth it to me to pursue. Like what's interesting to me and important to me isn't like the credential. Um, what's important to me is the training and experience that I garner and I can get that without going back to graduate school and getting a PsyD. And I have. I've been pretty rigorous about receiving post train post graduate school training. Um and um that's fine. Yeah. And then I think the psychologists charge more. Right? Like they can Depending. command a greater fee. Uh it, I see all over the board. I, oh, I right. have I have I've had supervisees who charge two hundred, two hundred and fifty an hour. <laughs> And right. they're associate licensed. They're they're green. And then I, I know psychologists that charge a hundred dollars an hour. So oh, right it, uh, yeah. now insurance, you can get a little bit more depending. Um, but sometimes yeah. it's hard to be panelled as a psychologist because they have too many psycho. Anyway, point is is that uh, yeah, you're right. Um, but you are quote unquote just a master's level therapist. I am just a master's level therapist. And I'm <laughs> and I and I know all the listeners and your clients would say you are in the top, you know, point one percent of therapists on the planet. Mm. So That's nice. you're a master's level therapist. Uh, would a would a doctorate make you any better? I don't think so. I don't w think would so. it would it make you now getting a PsyD like I have, mm -hmm. um, I think it, it would it did two things for me along what you're along the lines of what you're talking about. One is is that it gave me a chance to revisit a lot of things that mm -hmm. I learned previous, not only in my master's, but in my experience as a therapist for 10 years prior to getting my doctorate and really refine a lot of ideas. The other thing is psychology degrees cover so many different topics. <laughs> the other thing is that it's such a professional, it's such a, they hold their students to such a high standard. Mm -hmm. um, higher than master's level programs typically do. Yeah. And it attracts a certain kind of student as well that's kind of ready for that mm -hmm. standard. And it forces you to really adopt a very professionalized mindset and a and a research-oriented mindset, a scientific mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. Because 
if you know in a master's program you could get away with kind of being loose around your science knowledge and in a psychology doctorate in my experience there's you, you cannot you, you can you you you're literally studying statistics and psychometrics and math mm-hmm. and you know research methods and if mm-hmm. if if you choose to be a little squishy about that kind of stuff you literally won't uh graduate yeah um and just the the fact that in psychology all of the students and all the colleagues and all the professors like everyone agrees on that high level of professionalism and science-based work whereas in master's programs because of the nature that everyone master's pr- programs tend to have professors that came from those programs there's just less of an emphasis but i will say in master's level programs in counseling programs in marriage family therapy programs there's more emphasis on actual client care mm-hmm. on actually how do you how are you as a therapist in my experience the training for a psychologist is so broad and overly uh, if you want to become a, a, an actual helper of human beings you might know the science you might know how to give a good presentation about it you might know how to conduct research but knowing actually how to provide therapy that can get completely lost because the benefit of a master's program like marriage and family therapy counseling is all of your professors are pra- have been practicing clinicians and have active practices usually for many years in my psyd program about half or more of my professors had never even worked with a client before so i you know i would take statistics from a stats professor who had never even worked with a client so that is a very different culture and a very different set of mentorship that you're getting from them and i think that f- a lot of psychologists miss out on the deep mentorship that happens in a or it can happen in a marriage family therapy or counseling program where like all of these professors are just so knowledgeable and so experienced when it comes to the nitty-gritty of actually working with clients anyway you can be a psychologist you know licensed psychologist who has never seen a client uh, Mm -hmm. treated anybody and hang a shingle and say yep i'm i provide this service right. and have virtually you know a, a minimum of uh, experience in in clinical in 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 providing clinical care yeah and, and it's similar in a lot of different uh branches like uh if you're a, a marriage and family therapist master's level person you could become a professor like myself having never been trained on how to teach. <laughs> right. Um, you can, as a psychologist, become a professional uh, assessor, meaning you provide assessments and clinical assessments, having extremely limited experience and, and limited supervision around it. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, that's why we have ethics around scope and, and making sure that we all self-monitor and have people around us monitor but but it's also why people should ask questions because just because someone's got a shingle and can legally practice doesn't mean they have background training or experience right you should kick the tires on all these people (laughs) yeah to before you pick one right people shop for a car more rigorously than they shop for a therapist yeah true so uh to answer your question taylor uh you know which one is better when it comes to trauma therapist and counselor will tell you nothing um so it's important to ask this thing we were talking about earlier in terms of what's your approach and what you want to look for is a someone who answers the question (laughs) and doesn't blame you and pathologize you for asking (laughs) and also they have a care you know they provide an approach that involves being careful that's well paced that's evidence-based and the Mm -hmm. the kinds of procedures you want to you want to look for are what Bob and I use, which is prolonged exposure, emotional regulation, habituation. EMDR can be w- good as well. And if you have a simple trauma, meaning that it's not a lifetime of trauma, like it's just a s- one traumatic event, like a car accident or mm-hmm. maybe war trauma, then cognitive processing therapy or trauma-focused CBT can also be something you're looking for. Um, l- someone that says, I specialize in trauma, I would guess that at least 50% of the time, they have no idea what they're talking about. 
it, they think they do, but they don't. I, I don't have research on that, but that's just anecdotal. So what you want to look for are those are those approaches: prolonged yes. exposure, EMDR, cognitive processing therapy, trauma focused CBT. Are there any others that you can think of? Not evidence based. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if you don't hear them, like if you if you ask me the question, I would say I used I use prolonged exposure, but I use it in a very responsible way that I've learned through experience and supervision that I have to do. I don't just throw people into prolonged exposure. There's a lot of prep we have to do for it. That's what I would say. And if you asked me, what does that mean? I would lay it out for you. I, I would explain, and I have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so if you don't hear those words, I would be skeptical as to whether or not um, or you can even ask because maybe they don't think you know the word. You can be like, so do you use prolonged exposure? Do you use EMDR? Do you use CBT? Do you mm-hmm. use TFCBT? Mm-hmm. And if they're like, what's that? Then yeah, uh, you know. A, a good therapist is going to get turned on when they hear that. They, oh, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, I do. I do PE, man. That's my thing. Here, yeah. let me tell you about PE. They're going right. to turn on. Right, right, right. Because like, oh, cool. Uh, anonymous listener says, I don't understand the not taking sides rule for therapists. It seems very unfair to me. I was in therapy where I was physically, I was in a relationship where I was physically and emotionally abused. And there are always people who dismiss this. Not everyone contributes 50% and deserves 50% of the responsibility. I am tired of people with this mentality of, if he, mit- if he mistreated you so badly, maybe it's because you provoked him. Or it takes two to tango, so maybe you did something bad to him. I just want you to clarify why it is okay to dismiss the differences in power and damage by each individual in the relationship for the sake of a no sides rule. What do you think, Bob? I love this question. I'm so glad you're bringing it up and asking, and I completely agree with you. Um, The problem with this business of taking sides is it is invalidating. It invalidates your experience. Nobody's saying to you, you know what? That does suck. You got abused. That's awful. Like, I think just being a human next to another human you're going to, you know, like, how can you not care about that? And that has nothing to do with taking sides. This has everything to do with empathizing, empathizing. You can empathize and also see context, which I know is hard to talk about. And it sounds like blaming the victim, but, and I don't mean it that way, but I get it. I think English is limited in this way. I remember, do you, did you ever take a class from Dan Kelleher? No. When we were in school, I, he was my favorite, my absolute favorite. And one of the things he said to me that I've never forgotten is he said, Bob, language is linear. And the things that happen in the system don't, they're not as amenable to description with language. Co creation is not amenable to description. And it often it sounds linear, like, oh, that means X is to blame. I saw somebody recently who is really, really, really super angry with his uh, spouse. He's really angry with his spouse and he can get kind of edgy and righteous. And I think his edginess and his righteousness has a really negative impact on spouse. But the way, when you listen to him, you you, you can't help but hear the immense agony he's been in and how hard he's been trying for years to have connection with his partner and how much he loves and cherishes his partner. And he's hurting. And so who wouldn't be angry? Who wouldn't be? I mean, it's just silly. Talking about that with him, though, can feel, it gets kind of dicey because it can land like, oh, so you're saying I'm the problem, right? You're saying I'm the problem. And it's sort of like, well, no, you're not the problem. And yeah, actually, you have a contribution. And the things that you do, do impact your partner and impact your partner's behavior towards you. And your partner ends up behaving towards you in a way that is freaking awful. And it goes for abuse, too. But language, English language, at least, I don't know if other languages are better. English language can be so linear that it lands this way. So, but what I think is most important about your question is you're saying, I need, I require empathy, and I completely agree. You've been through hell. You absolutely deserve and require empathy, care, consideration, compassion. You, you, it does suck, right? It, it suck. Listen to me. I mean, that's just nutty. That's just scratching the surface about how bad it is. Yeah. And I'm very sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, I get this question a lot from students as I walk them through self-analysis. Yeah. A big part of 
the process is for therapists to take responsibility. And some therapists in training have been through terrible abuse. And they're like, wait, are you saying that I need to take responsibility for the way my dad treated me? And what I say is there, this idea of blame is actually, as Bob was saying, really complicated. But in terms of using the language, I will say that number one, yes, sometimes one person is 100% to blame. Yes. If there's abuse, if it's a child, even if it's intimate partner violence between people the same age, I might even extend it to a lot of moments of infidelity. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. You cannot blame another person for these things. It is literally victim blaming. Yes. So uh, yeah, if someone gets really angry and strikes you, if someone is controlling you through various different means, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's no excuse for it. There, it's a it's a hundred hundred percent in especially when as you're talking about uh, anonymous listener, the the power dynamic mm -hmm. needs to be considered. And so, yeah, we would we would blame one person for this. Um, now there might be a lot of outside factors that contribute to this person committing these problems, these abuses, past trauma, maybe even the spouse or the family members triggering them. But that doesn't mean that these other people or the victims are responsible, quote unquote. So yeah, we absolutely want to hold those responsible. Uh, and this two, takes two to tango or mm -hmm. considering all sides or systemic points of view, don't, uh, don't take that away. Um, and the abuse that I've experienced in, in my life uh, mainly as an adult, uh, I don't blame myself for it at all. And if anyone wants to blame me for it, now uh, you might be able to point out and I might be able to point out like how I might've contributed kind of to the dynamic, but mm -hmm. the way in which I was being treated is a hundred percent not on me. Um, number two, in a lot of conflict in relationships, it, it's, you know, m not a hundred percent. And it's, 50-50 or 75-25. And for both people, it almost always feels like it is 100% the other person's fault or 99% <laughs> yeah. the other. Bob is laughing because the two of us <laughs> in our personal lives with our spouses or even with each other, mm. that when there's a conflict, it's like, I'm not to blame the other yep. person. Yeah. And it's normal to feel that way. Sure. So that's important to, to think, but I'm not taking away from those instances where someone is 100% to blame yeah. for abuse and a partner violence. The third thing is, is thinking systemically, mm -hmm. which can be helpful. And it is a different paradigm, especially as a therapist that can be helpful. Getting away from this idea of blame, getting mm -hmm. away from this idea of responsibility really, because who cares? Uh, if, if we're trying to improve, you know, if a couple comes in and they're saying, we, we get in fights all the time. It is not helpful for me as a therapist to say, okay, who's to blame? <laughs> Which person has more of the blame? <laughs> it, they're there to improve on it. And so each person can do something to reduce that conflict. And right. so each person is, I'm going to tell each person what they're going to do. Now, in the back mm -hmm. of my mind, I might be thinking, well, you know, this thing would go faster if the one person mm -hmm. did this and that, you know, mm -hmm. more so than, you know, it's more weighted toward the other person. But- I don't really think uh, that person is to blame. The other yeah. person is not. Now, in my counter-transferential moments, I might, if I'm triggered or yeah. losing perspective or something, right. then I, I might fall into that mindset. But, but, uh, but it's not a helpful mindset to have. But right. like I said, anonymous listener, if you were abused and you have determined that you have, you know, nothing to do with the responsibility aspect of it. Maybe you did things to trigger the person, but you know, like a trigger could be like you weren't paying attention to them one day or something. Right. And they decided to beat you then. And you've determined I'm not to blame. And you find other people are saying, well, what did you do? Yeah. You know, the, the examples you give are on its face ridiculous. I mean, someone's saying like, if he mistreated you so badly, maybe it was because you provoked him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that doesn't sound like an accurate way of looking at it. Um, and we have a culture of victim blaming. It's a very common thing. And some therapists will even fall into this problem. Uh, it's just easier to blame victims yeah. uh, because they're less likely to, to harm us, you know, and 
we have a patriarchal system that also supports men and their aggression and their control and power. And so, yeah, there's a lot of reasons for this. And um, from your descri description, I'm a listener. Not only were you abused, but you were you were secondarily abused by others who were blaming you for the problem and not validating you, which is not fair. Nicely put. Hey, you know, you said something interesting to me that stuck with me last year. I'm, I'll never forget it. Uh, and I, th I don't know if we were on the podcast, if we were just chatting. I think we were just chatting. No, it was on the podcast. Um, you said, I wonder what it was like for your dad to experience you as his son. And we were talking specific about my father's abuse of me. And I had never thought about what is my impact on him. Like, what is it like to be my dad? What's it like for him to have a son who's, however it was he experienced me? I mean, I, one of the awful things that happened when I was young is he used to be really angry and he would say to me, wipe that look off your face. Like he'd be outraged and he'd say, wipe that look off your face. And to be honest with you, I was so scared back then. I couldn't feel my face. I don't even, I still don't know what look I had, but you know what? I did have a look, whatever it was. I had it, aware of it or not, I had it, and it was having an impact on him. Am I responsible for his behavior? No, but what's happening between us? What's, what's happening between us that's leading him to the unilateral move to, you know, abuse uh, yell, abuse, whatever, right? Yeah. So I think about uh, infidelity like that, and I, you could imagine anything like that. It's, because we had a counselor say this, I think they were talking, it doesn't matter, um, that infidelity is a unilateral response to a problem in the relationship. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Right. I yeah. like that. Right. It acknowledges that it's often a problem in the relationship, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a, but the person who committed the infidelity is 100% to blame. Yes. And it means that the victim is not blamed, but yes. the victim can consider, let's work on the relationship so it doesn't right. happen again. Right. And that's a weird, that's a both and weird way of looking at the world. It, it is. And we are not taught this by society, by reality television, no. by big time wrestling. There's always the villain, the heel, and the good guy. There's right. always the Darth Vader and the Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's really hard to have both and thinking to think, yes, I am not to blame, but I contribute. <laughs> like, how, how does that make sense? Yeah. How, how do, how do the, I hold on to both of those things? Right. And that's uh, what Bob was talking about earlier in terms of like language is linear. Yeah. At least in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, I continually have to force myself. It's sort of like when I try to imagine the universe being infinite or that time is infinite, I have to really stretch my brain <laughs> and thinking like, okay, wh what does that mean again? Um, and, but my mind always goes back to, of course, there's an edge to the universe because there's an edge to everything, right? But then you think, well, what's beyond the universe? What's beyond that edge? <laughs> Is it, there's got to be something beyond that, the edge. And it's the same when it comes to systems thinking. It's, mm -hmm. uh, so everything is happening at the same time and everyone is contributing knowingly or not. And nothing is linear, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it's a very hard thing to keep in mind and and even though I've taught systems thinking for 25 years I, I I have to work at it every time me too I thought systems theory was bogus when we were in school and it really me, yeah you, like, you were a counselor you didn't have to yeah no uh, Larry Darienza Do you oh yeah yeah he was a nice guy um, I liked him as a teacher and, you know, it's all new to me anyway. So he's talking about holons and like homeostasis. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really know what this means in Salmonution and, you know, whatever. Um, it took me years to understand systems. And, and it yeah. is because uh, my background and training is in individual therapy. 
uh, that part of my background and training was in individual therapy. And so, but understanding things in systems has been an eye opener and it is, it's so hard to hold on to because it's so easy to fall into linear one way thinking, which is like you said, reality TV and pro wrestling and the whole thing. And part of, I think what's causing the suffering of the person who wrote in is that simplified cause and effect, um, universe where we think we know what causes and we don't see cause as effect but effect causes cause right right if that's the way to say it yeah and when i think back to paul david was my teacher in systems and Mm -hmm. i only remember one thing from that class he walked in the class he had an orange and he placed it on a table actually he placed it on where you put the erasers on on the chalkboard you know Mm -hmm. no chalkboard and he (laughs) said he said, describe this orange. And he really let it breathe, you know, and people are like, what's he, what's he getting at? <laughs> and in the end, his big point was, which was, I think, what his point was, but completely lost on me. And I think the entire class at the time mm-hmm. was that this, the orange is a system as a part of a system. You could consider it an individual thing, but it also is a part of the, its environment, and it's affected by the environment, and it's affecting its environment. And there's a, but there's a boundary. You know, there's the peel, which is the boundary between the unit and the the rest of the system. Um, but I don't think he really, or I maybe I just didn't really get it. But that's the only thing I remember. Yeah. And then beyond that, and I remember you know learning about salad minutia and everything. It took me five to 10 years of teaching systems, literally uh-huh. teaching the uh-huh. class that I took from Paul for me uh-huh. to understand systems theory, kind of. Uh-huh. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's apparent, you know, my students, I would say uh, a fifth of them kind of can demonstrate that they understand systems theory by the time they graduate. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I spend a lot of time on it. It's hard to get. Um, so imagine so, that you spend time on trying to learn it and it takes a long time to learn. Yeah. Somebody who's never been exposed to it is likely to fall into this really over simple right. cause effect nonsense. That, well, or the simplification of no one's to blame uh, as, yes. a, as a, yeah. a right. heuristic for systems thinking. Right, right, right. Which might cause inadvertent mm-hmm. victim blaming. Anyway. Yeah. Great well, letter. we didn't, I'm glad we didn't get to in. all the emails, so we're oh. going to have to save some of the ethical, professional questions for next time. All right. Uh, the next one that we'll talk about next time, Bob, is another big time yikes, so uh, everyone will have to wait for that one. Okay. And this was fun. Th- I'm so glad people wrote in and asked these really important questions. Fun. Yeah. That's not the right word. This was stimulating, interesting, yeah. and really important. I'd say fun. Uh, I, I like doing this podcast in all its yeah. various forms and yeah. including talking with you and making oh, fun thanks. of therapists. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, including ourselves. Okay. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Uh, wait. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Why should they take care of themselves, Bob? Because you deserve it. <laughs> yeah.